Welcome to Coach Bennett's Podcast, where every run has a purpose, where kindness is hardcore, where this is about running, and this is not about running, where every starting line is a finish line in disguise, where rambling still gets you where you need to be, where pineapple will never ruin your pizza, and the sodas, adult and not adult kind, are always cold, and where there is room on the starting line for everybody. I'm Coach Bennett. Thank you for letting me be a part of your day. Let's get started. 44. Welcome to episode 44 of Coach Bennett's podcast. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for helping us get to episode 44. And we've got a great episode. We've got a fantastic episode. One thing we don't have is a complicated episode, but um, bum, that's right. The name of episode 44 is running isn't complicated. Runners are, that's right. Or it's going to be running isn't complicated, but runners are, or running isn't complicated, but runners sure are. I'm not really sure. I've said it in so many slightly different ways that maybe the most complicated part about this entire episode is going to be figuring out what the episode is called. But it doesn't really matter, does it? Because you get it? Because it's really not that complicated. We're going to be talking about how running is not complicated. We are also going to be talking about why it gets overcomplicated. Hint, runners. We're going to talk about all of the things that get overcomplicated, and we are going to decomplicate uncomplicate, decomplicate. Why why did I go there? All I had to think of is what's the word because it's not an uncommon word. Uncomplicate. We're going to uncomplicate seemingly complicated subjects over the course of this episode. So I'm super excited about it. I'm fired up about it. And I'll tell you what, I'm inspired because I've gotten a couple of conversations over the last week with, I'm not going to say non-runners because I believe that everyone is meant to be a runner. It's just that they're either running right now or not running right now. So it's really not a case of runner and non-runner. It's a case of a runner who's running or a runner who's just not running. And you could even add maybe a third category of a runner who's running or not running but doesn't believe they're a runner. So that's, that's a whole other category. But I've had a couple of conversations asking about different things they've either seen online, read about in a magazine, uh, maybe it's come up on a run they've been on, and other conversations with people that are not running currently. They're, They're thinking about starting, and they're asking questions about what they should do, or they've heard about certain aspects of running, and I've, I've had to uncomplicate what was seemingly complicated for them. And like that's one of the reasons why I'm excited about this podcast, not just this episode 44, but just the podcast in general, is it is an outlet uh, kind of at scale to have these conversations. As I mentioned a few episodes back um, where I was talking about how I, I don't believe that you have to experience something to get the lesson from something. Sure, there are certain experiences that maybe are best experienced. Um, But it doesn't mean that every lesson has to come from a personal experience. If you're learning about it from someone else's personal experience, often that is a strong enough message. It is a powerful enough lesson for you to take those requisite lessons that you need to. And that's what I'm hoping this episode really does for a number of the things that often get complicated and they don't need to be. Now, from a coach's perspective, this is like one of my truths as a coach, which is running isn't complicated, but runners are. And it shows up in my coaching um, in a lot of different ways. I would say that the foundational way it shows up is that I know that I could have the same question being asked at practice, or in DMs, or on emails, or in the mailbag, an infinite variety of ways, even though it's the same question, because everyone's experiencing it slightly different. So one, I think it gives a level of patience um, that I, I need as a coach, 
where I'm not looking at it as how is this not getting through? Well, sometimes, and this, this helped in the classroom as well, I would need to tell the same story as a history teacher slightly different ways. The, the underlying story is the same. The truth of the story is the same. The shading, the lighting, some of the words I'm using, the adjectives, they may need to change. The, the, the way I'm talking about it, um, with, with one student, I may need to be a little bit more excited about the topic, a little bit more theatrical. And for another student, I may lose them if I'm too theatrical, if, if I'm too melodramatic about it. It may take some of the weight, the gravity of the actual story from the story. And it may just be me robbing the actual excitement and power of the story by, by turning it into more of a narrator thing than really what the narrative is. So that's, that's one of the philosophies of my coaching and of my teaching um, that, you know, it's, it's important to understand that sometimes you need to answer the, th- the same question a slightly different way. It doesn't change the answer. It just changes how you deliver the answer, okay? Like that's just... That's just something that is foundational um, to the way I coach. So if you've, if you've run with me, if you've been at a number of events with me, you may hear me saying something. You're like, you know what? That kind of fits with what he said last time, but, I, but he said it very differently last time. Well, then you saw it in action. So we're going to talk about some of these things. I am going to unravel what's not complicated, but seemingly complicated about it. And then I will obviously answer the question and I'll try to do it in a couple of different ways. So one of them is, is like a very, very basic one. I was in San Antonio a few weeks back and there was a gentleman there who wanted to start running again. And after, I don't know, an opening salvo of five minutes of all of the complications about starting to run and what was stopping him from starting to run and and what he was concerned about in starting to run and measuring himself against who he was in the past and concerned he wasn't going to reach who he was in the future. I, and I, I talked a little bit about this, I believe, in the last episode. I just said, hey, man, can you run five minutes? And he looked at me just like... Yes, but you're, are you listening to all of the other things I just told you? I know I can run five minutes. And I said, if, if you can run five minutes and you can start, it, it doesn't need to be anything more than that. We don't have to talk about your pace. I don't need to know about what terrain you're running on. I don't even need to know what shoes you're really running in. If you can run for five minutes, just run for five minutes. And let's just break it down really, really easily here into just a few terms that you're going to want to run with and kind of have as, as these rolling mantras through your head. Does this feel easy? Do I feel in control? Am I having fun? Like if you can answer those three in the affirmative, like, yes, this feels easy. Yes, I'm in control. Yes, I'm having fun. Then stop at five minutes. And if right before you stop at five minutes, you're thinking, I could go a little bit longer, that's where you say no. That's it. That's all you need to do to start. We can then have a follow-up conversation about what comes next, but we can't talk about what comes next until we know that what came first is done. So it's just five minutes. And then there were the follow-up questions because there's no possible way it could be this easy. There's just no way that starting in the sport could be this easy. It's like, well, you know, it was, shouldn't I know what my cadence is? You know, what about my form? Um, You know, what what should I be uh, fueling and and hydrating with before and after the, and I just, it's a stop. Just run five minutes. You don't have to change your life. You don't have to worry about what you ate before or after. Just, you know, as long as you're eating and drinking throughout the day, you're going to be fine. I mean, the only thing I'd be really concerned about is if you were really malnourished or if you were really dehydrated. So as long as you're not those things, let's not worry about it. Why complicate a five-minute run? Okay, well, I mean, should I go to the track? What's easiest? What's easiest, man? Is it going from your front door? Is it going straight from work before you go to your car? Is it going to the track? What You tell me what's easiest for you. And it wasn't like a trick question, which I think he was thinking maybe it is. 
You know, like, oh, I see it. You're asking me what's easiest because when I say what's easiest, you're going to say, aha, you can't run because you just want to take the easy way out. Nope. Again, not trying to be tricky here. Just do what's easiest. If it's easiest to run from home and get your five minute running, then run from home. That's that's it. It's easy. Remember, the goal is to get your first run in and ending it wanting to run again. So there's a next run. That's it. That's all you got to do. Nothing more. It's that simple. Now, as humans, what we are so good at is complicating, uncomplicated things. We're going to start bringing stuff in because like, there's just no possible way it could be this easy. It could be this simple. It could be this uncomplicated. And that's where doing a first run, starting in the sport, starting again, starting over becomes complicated because we complicate it. We will bring our history in the sport to the starting line. And I get it. And as a coach, I'm okay with that. Tell me about it. Let's walk through it. If you need to get some stuff off your chest, that's okay. I should hear some of this stuff so I can empathize with you. I can be a little bit more knowledgeable about some things that are going to come up as barriers, sometimes mental or emotional barriers or roadblocks. All of this is important. And running five minutes at a relaxed, easy pace is not complicated. Yes, this other stuff may be complicating it. That's fine. But let's also understand it's just running for five minutes, which you can do. It's just running for five minutes. That's all you need to do. And we can work through some of the other stuff. What should I be fueling with before the run? Like I said, it doesn't matter. I understand you want to know because you already want to make these changes to become fitter and healthier and all that good stuff. And we can cross over this bridge when we get to it. I understand. I I, I get it. Okay, I've got a pair of old running shoes. I haven't run in them in two years. Shouldn't I go out and get a new pair of running shoes? Shouldn't I go and get fitted and get my gait check? Listen, we're just running for five minutes. It's fine. You've been walking around in penny loafers for all the people. Thumbs up if you remember penny loafers. You even have a penny in them. You've been walking around in penny loafers all day long. And you say you wear these penny loafers every day, five days a week at work. Okay, I'm just making up. I don't know if people still wear penny loafers anymore. And if they do, if they wear them at work, I'm sure there are some jobs where you wear penny loafers. But anyway, you're wearing these dress shoes every day, all day long. Believe me, your feet, your body can handle running in running shoes that are two years old for five minutes. Considering you're walking around and basing these in these like Dutch wooden shoes that penny loafers feel like. Believe me, I, I tried on penny loafers when I was a kid. And I'm like, these are not for me. So let's not worry about what the perfect shoe is for you right now. All you need is that imperfect shoe in your closet to get this first run done. We don't need to complicate it with any of that other stuff. That's the process that sometimes I go through and I tell athletes to go through when they're coming up against a hurdle, a barrier, some type of issue with their running or in life is look at it and say, is the actual issue complicated or am I complicating everything around the issue? And as a result, it becomes like these issues are like a invisible force field around the actual issue. And you've got to, you know, you keep coming up trying to do your first run. You keep like, ba-boom. Like, what am I hitting? Like, why can't I do the first run? Oh, it's, it's because I don't know what to eat afterwards. Or ba-boom, I'm not doing the first run because I don't know what shoes to wear. Ba-boom, I don't know what to do because I don't know how fast I should run. You're focusing on all of these issues that really have nothing to do with the actual real issue. They're peripheral things that bounce around that we can talk about after you do the five minute easy run. So when I say running isn't complicated, it comes up quite a bit when people ask about how to start running. And obviously that would lead to how to keep running, build up my training, increase my volume, pick up the pace. Suddenly that becomes really complicated and sometimes it becomes so complicated 
it becomes overwhelming. And when it becomes overwhelming, people don't overcome it. They get overwhelmed by it, which means they just sometimes just stop running as a result. Or they get into what they think is a groove that turns into a rut where they're not picking up the pace. They're not picking up the volume out of maybe fear or ignorance of how to do it. And they think that obviously the only way to properly do it is to work with a really, really brilliant coach, which all of you working with me understand you don't need to be a brilliant coach, right? I mean, I hope that's what I've proved to everyone is you don't need brilliance to figure this stuff out because it's not that complicated and I'm not that brilliant or brilliant at all unless there's a few people who think I'm brilliant and then maybe you are brilliant and you thinking me brilliant actually confirms that I'm brilliant. So if you're a brilliant person and you think I'm brilliant, listen, by all means, reach out and say, hey, coach, I think you're brilliant and I'm brilliant too and it takes one to know one. So thank you. We could turn it into like a little rhyme anyway. All right, so how, how do you build up your training? How do you increase your volume? How do you get better? Which is really what someone's asking me when they say, oh, geez, I've now been running for a little while, but I don't know what to do next. Um, do I increase the volume? Do I increase the, 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 the duration? Do I increase the speed? How many days should I be doing speed workouts? Should I be doing long runs every single week? What, what is the percentage? I should be increasing the volume. I read somewhere that it's 20%. And so is it always 20%? Is it sometimes 20%? And it's like, whoa, just calm down. This isn't complicated. And then I'll get that look like, what do you mean it's not complicated? I just, I just told you so many different things that I don't know. And it's like, that's fine. Don't confuse not knowing with what you don't know being complicated. Don't do that. You don't know the story of every movie you're watching for the first time. Unless it's been an adaptation from a book, some nerd is going to go, well, technically, if you've read the book and then they turned it into a movie, you do know the story. Okay, let's just pretend there is no adaptation from a book. It's just a an original screenplay. You've never seen the trailer. You start it. You have no idea who these people are on the screen. You don't know what the story is. Other than a few people in my life who inevitably will ask a question 30 seconds into a movie, who's that? Oh my gosh, we're going to find out. We're going to find out. It's the start of the movie. None of us in the room know what this lady's name is. But I think we're going to find out. Or at least we're going to find out why she's in the movie. We just have to watch more than 30 seconds of the movie. And that's what your experience with running is. It's a level of patience. Patience is a form of confidence. You're going to figure it out. Maybe you won't be figuring it out all on your own. You'll have coaches in your lives, teammates in your lives, magazines in your lives, podcasts that you like, websites that you like. You're going to have runs where you're going to be learning stuff. You're going to figure it out. Now, asking is great. That's a sign of confidence as well to ask for help. So I'll tell you, I'll probably have more questions to ask you. Like how many days a week are you running right now? How many days a week do you feel like you could commit to running? What are some of your goals? What are some of your resources in terms of how much time can you give to running? Because lots of people work. Lots of people go to school. Lots of people have other things in their lives that they are responsible for. So I can't just tell somebody, well, hey, let's do uh, two speed runs each week and let's do a long run and let's do four recovery runs. They're like, wait, that's seven days. I can only run for three. So part of uncomplicating how to set up your training is to just know yourself, which can, I know, be a complicated thing, learning about yourself, but some of this is pretty basic. You should know how many days you are comfortable committing to. You should know, looking at your schedule, more often than not, how much time you can commit to this. You may have a goal. It's okay if you don't have a specific goal like a race or a certain distance you want to cover. It could just be, I just want to get started or keep going in running. Fantastic. We'll figure it out. 
We'll break it down. And yes, some weeks it may be two speed runs that week. Some weeks it may be one speed run that week. Some weeks it may be no speed runs that week. Some weeks it may be the focus on the long run and other times it'll be long stretches. The focus is just on the recovery runs. That's not complicated once you know who the runner is, what their goal is, their commitment level, the amount of time they have, how they're feeling. That's all you need to do. It sounds like us coaches have these, you know, incredible ideas. Like we're going to do this workout and this is how structured it is. And this is how many intervals at this distance with this recovery. This is the pace. And the next day it's going to be this very specific, you know, recovery amount of minutes, which is what I always find hilarious when I see like online some coach saying, hey, the best way to run a 5K and then they'll literally give like one workout or they'll give like a week's training. And on one of the days, it'll say something like, you know, on Thursday, I want you to run 3.7 miles. And I'm like, 3.7, geez, okay, it's specific. Because, I mean, you know, God forbid you run 3.5, you know, you screw everything up. Or if you run four, it's just like, come on. Like, it's it's not that specific. It's not that complicated. You know what I mean? It's a lot of finesse. It's a lot of adjusting. It's a lot of using the eraser on the end of the pencil. And it's a lot of using a pencil instead of a pen when you're putting together things like this. If the athletes knew how much we are changing and adjusting and sometimes second guessing what we're asking you to do, I think it would be a real benefit to the athletes to understand that it's not set in stone. It's never been set in stone. Or at least if it was set in stone, there's a reason why there was a very frustrated runner or coach who picked up the stone tablet and threw it on the ground and it broke into a million pieces. Okay? So how you build up your volume, how you build up your strength, how you build up your endurance, how you get faster, all of that stuff, it's not that complicated. It really is about patience. It really is about lots of listening, a lot of watching, a lot of paying attention, a lot of conversations with the coach, and sometimes you're your own best coach. A lot of it is just doing what needs to be done and understanding that sometimes you got to push, sometimes you got to pull back. You're always asking the athlete how they're doing, how are they feeling, and then adjust. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Then adjust. And a lot of it, to be honest, is just common sense. I mean, if you ran, you know, 4K last week and you hadn't run in four months, just because you feel good doesn't mean you should go out and try to run 40K. At the same time, 20% of 4,000 meters is 800 meters. Yes, you can run more than 4,800 meters in week two. Okay? You can. Like that's, it's, it's not a problem. So the 20% rule, well, it makes sense depending on the volume. It is one of those things where it's like captain obvious moment. If you ran one day last week and you ran for five minutes and you covered a thousand meters, that doesn't mean in week two, you can only run 1200 meters. If you're suddenly planning, I think I can run two days this week. You're not going to do a 600 meter run and a 600 meter run. I mean, I guess you could, but you don't have to be limited to this 20% rule. This is just like a little sidebar of just saying sometimes context is really important. If you're running 50 miles a week and you're, you know, you're trying to increase your volume more or less consistently for the next 10 weeks, then yeah, you got to be careful that it's also not just a little bit more next week and then more next week and then more next week. Sometimes it's just dropping back, soaking up some of the training relieving some of the pressure of increasing the volume. Okay. But like I said, this, these are the conversations where the answer is not like, Oh, you know, the, the clouds parted and suddenly there was like an MIT astrophysicist telling us this is how you increase volume. A lot of running and coaching runners is just pure common sense. That's it. And the reason why there's always going to be a spot for a good coach is because common sense is uncommon. It's just, that's how it is. Most people lack common sense, especially when it comes to themselves. They know themselves better than anybody. 
They treat themselves worse than anyone else they know. And they make really weird, bizarre decisions when it comes to themselves. Which is why you need good friends, teachers, confidants, and coaches always and forever in your life. I'm going to move on to another one. How do you stay motivated? I get this question all the time. And I think people think there's some type of magic elixir that I drink to stay motivated. So when I answer them with the most uncomplicated answer you could possibly give, there is looks of confusion. Now think about it. You're giving an answer that's straightforward and uncomplicated, and people are confused by it initially. Because my answer is, I'm not motivated all the time. I'm not even close to motivated all the time. Part of the reason why people think I'm motivated all the time is because they don't see me all the time. And when they do see me, I'm doing my job. I'm coaching. And my job is to serve you. I am motivated to serve you. I work hard to serve my athletes, wherever they may be, in whatever kind of relationship it is, whether it's on a guided run, or whether it's on my newsletter, or whether it's through the podcast, or whether I'm putting a post, or a TikTok up, or a reel, I am motivated to help. But that doesn't mean an hour later, when I'm walking home, I'm motivated, I'm not tired, exhausted, wondering if I'm doing a good job, wondering if I'm any good at being a coach, if I'm making any difference whatsoever, wondering if I should be doing something else with my life. All of these things happen. You know why? Because I'm a human being. I'm, I'm not just this motivated, fired up, excited person. I am just like my athletes. My job is to help the athletes with everything I've got. That's the difference when we're together. I'm there to serve. They're there to compete. They're there to run. They're there to perform. They're there to work to become better versions of themselves. I am there to help. I always like to look at it as like it's a rock concert, okay? I'm the roadie. I'm there making sure that the set list is taped in front of you. I'm making sure that the lights are rigged the right way. I'm there to make sure that your guitar and the bass and the drums, they're all tuned just right for you. I'm there to make sure that the mic works. I'm there that you have your waters. So in between songs, when you need a sip, it's there. I, that's what I'm there for. You're there to rock. You're there to make music. You're there to put on a show. That's, and to me, every time you go for a run, it's a show. It's a performance. It's a work of art. I'm there to help you do that. So when you see a roadie at work, it's amazing. They're everywhere they need to be. They're showing up and they're tightening the microphone stand. They're, they're handing a new guitar, taking the old guitar. They're moving around to make sure that, you know, that, that where that water spilt, they wipe it up real quick so then the lead singer doesn't slip and fall. Like, they're doing all of this stuff and it's amazing. You're like, wow, this is crazy. What we don't see is four hours before the show, they're taking a nap because they're wiped out. We don't see them sitting down after they've loaded up all the gear and they've got a headache and their shoulders hurt and they're just like, am I, am I, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? You have those moments. But when you see them at work, man, it's incredible. You can see they are doing what they love. And if you do what you love, you're going to be exhausted and fatigued by it. You're just not going to feel empty, but you are you are going to have doubts about whether you're doing a good job and whether you should do it. So how do you stay motivated all the time? You don't. You don't stay motivated all the time. But that doesn't mean that you're not meant to be doing what you're doing. It just means you're tired. It just means you may be frustrated. It just means you may be confused. It just means you're human. And sometimes what running does is it offers us an opportunity to teach us that even when we're not high on motivation, even when it doesn't feel like we're incredibly inspired, we can still get the job done. We can still do what we need to do. We can still do what we want to do when we're trying to convince ourselves we don't want to do it because we know 
that sometimes it's just going to be like that. And beating yourself up for not being motivated or thinking you're lesser than because you're not always motivated like so-and-so is. Well, so-and-so is not always motivated. I'm telling you now. And if they tell you they're always motivated, well, one, they're not always motivated, and two, they're liars. They're liars. So it's not complicated. There isn't a magic elixir to stay motivated all the time. There isn't some way to set up your schedule perfectly so you always are motivated. It's just not reality. And I will also say this, when people reach out to me and they ask for advice when they're not motivated or they feel like they've lost motivation, I usually respond back and say, if you're asking me how to get your motivation back, or how to find your motivation that you feel you lost. Let me tell you this, you never lost it because you're motivated right now to find more motivation. So yes, maybe you're low on motivation, but you're not with no motivation. And that's a really great starting point because motivation can kind of just recycle itself, build itself up, grow itself, okay? Just a good thing to remember. Okay, I've got a couple more because I I think this is a really good episode to kind of break into parts to kind of de... Oh my gosh, did I I have to say decomplicate again? To uncomplicate certain things that have to do with running, all right? And so I don't want to belabor it by doing like a a 90-minute let's uncomplicate all of these different things. I think it may be fun actually to have some of you send me ideas about what are certain things that have to do with running. It can be as specific as you want, as general as you want. It doesn't matter. As personal as you want. And maybe I can then uncomplicate it on another episode of Coach Bennett's podcast. That's a great idea. In fact, send me those ideas, whether it's uh, to the mailbag, which I personally love, or maybe I'll put in... Um, I think on Spotify, I can definitely do it, a question on there saying like, what are some topics you'd like me to uncomplicate about running? That's uh, that's definitely one place I'll do. Then obviously you can always send me um, DMs, emails, uh, stuff like that on threads. You can reach out to me, wh- whatever it may be. Get to me the way that you want to get to me and, and there we go. Okay, so maybe we'll do one more right now because I, I already know we're going we're gonna to get a lot of these, which is great. I know we're probably going to get something on shoes. I bet that, like how to pick the right race, um, something like that, how to get over being injured or come back from being sick or injured. So there's a lot of cool stuff we can uncomplicate, which actually sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, this is going to be great. All right, so how about... Um, I get asked a lot about people's form personally, their form, like, okay, how do I get my form better or how do I perfect my form? And now some of this does come from a few years ago. There was just a lot of articles about running form and this, and this is what I mean about complicating things. I'd say about eight years ago, maybe was like the height of this. I don't know, which means we're overdue for it happening again. This idea of running form and how you can perfect it and all this stuff. So let me just start by uncomplicating the running form conversation. There is no perfect running form. Although I will say I've uh, Sebastian Coe is pretty close, but uh, we're, anyway, the point I digress. There is no perfect running form. What you should do is go out and I think this this actually helps. It used to help when I was coaching high school athletes that were like, my form doesn't look like Jimmy's form or my form doesn't look like Sarah's form. And I'd say it, your form doesn't need to, nor should it. You have your own form. The question isn't how do we get your form more like theirs? We say, how do we make your form stronger? How do we get the most efficiency out of your form? How do we make you better at running as you. That's the key. Go out and watch Paula Radcliffe. Okay. Go watch Paula Radcliffe. Go to YouTube. Look up Paula Radcliffe. R-A-D-C-L-I-F-F-E. Okay. And watch her running form. Now, this is the thing. Paula Radcliffe was at one point the world record holder in the marathon. Had destroyed the previous records in the marathon. 
And her form is is wholly hers. W H O L L Y. No one was watching her win major marathons, set world records, and saying, I want my form to look like hers. She had a crazy head bob. Her shoulders would come up a lot. No one was trying to copy or mimic Paula Radcliffe's form. And yet, no one could beat her. Now, if she had gone out and tried to completely change her form, I, uh, I don't think it would have worked. I think she probably would have gotten hurt. Her body had to run a certain way, and then it was okay. With that certain way, how do we take advantage of the way you're running? There's another athlete, Haile Geber Selassie, one of my favorite athletes of all time. He's an Ethiopian distance runner, Haile, H-A-I-L-E, and Geber Selassie, his last name is G-E-B-R-S-E-L-A-S-S-I-E. Yeah, that's it. Geber Selassie would be G-E-B-R-S-E-L-A-S-S-I-E. All right. Loved watching Haile Geber Selassie run. Unbelievable 5K and 10K runner. But he had one arm that basically just kind of hung up close to his chest and it was because he spent uh, a long period of his life running to school holding his books in his arm that way so one arm kind of drove and one arm kind of didn't and it was because he had taught his body to run that way because he ran in the morning and in the afternoon every single day to school and from school holding books So for the rest of his life, he was holding phantom books every time he raced. Now, no one went out there and said, run as if one of your arms is holding a bunch of phantom books if you want to run really fast. Of course you wouldn't do that. You wanted to have your shoulders low, driving both your arms nice and loose, because that's the most efficient way of doing it. That's that's where you're going to get power. That's where you're going to get better knee drive. Well, Hiley couldn't do that. They didn't, they didn't try, maybe they did try to change his form, but they couldn't. And guess what? It, it, who cares? Dude won back-to-back 10K gold medals at the Olympics in one of the greatest 10Ks in history. Him and Paltzer got battling against each other. Maybe someday I'll do the play-by-play for that. Oh my gosh, what an incredible race. And now here's the cool thing. Like I mentioned, Haile Geber Selassie. I'm do- yes, I'm doing a little tangent here. Get over it. Haile Geber Selassie ran for Ethiopia. Paul Turgot ran for Kenya. It's like Duke, Carolina. Um, it's like Yankees, Red Sox. Or if you're into uh, basketball this season, it's like LSU, Iowa. Ooh, like the rivalry is intense and spirited and great. Anyway, we'll get, we'll get into that a little bit more. But Haile Geber Selassie won back-to-back Olympic 10Ks. Did he have perfect form? No. Unless you want to say he had perfect form for Haile Geber Selassie, which was Haile Geber Selassie's form. So when you're working on your form, don't be chasing someone else's perfection. One, they're never going to get it. And two, it's the wrong thing to chase for you. What you want to do is strengthen your own form. There are certain foundational things that will help. And when we do a systems check and a form check in the guided runs, those basic things, those basic cues are really all you need to do. And understanding that a lot of times your form will break down as you get fatigued. Your form will break down and get even worse when you lose focus. So you're not just doing form cues at moments where you're fatigued or you're losing focus, you're doing it because you're trying to develop the habit, better habits of better form. And there are other strengthening exercises you can do to make your form better. You know, a lot of core work, there's, there's driving arms, there's, there's lots of different things you can do to make your form better. But it's your form better, a better version of your form. It's not you chasing some form that doesn't really exist. And if it does, It's somebody else's. It's not yours. Okay? There are certain traits that maybe we can all share, like that slight lean forward instead of our head cocked back and our chin up and leaning back where we're excessively landing on our heels. Most people land on their heels, so don't worry about it. Where you're excessively landing on your heels, and that means you're basically 
driving yourself into the ground as opposed to driving yourself forward. You're also putting a lot of stress on your lower back and your hamstrings. You're shortening your stride. There's all there's, You don't want to do any of that. But the fixes are going to be fixes you need to do in your form. It's going to be you having a slight lean forward, just the chin gently leading the chest. It's going to be you relaxing your shoulders. That's going to look slightly different on you than it does on Paula Radcliffe. It's going to be you making sure that you're having your arms going by, ideally, your waist and driving back. But you know what? If you're Haile Geber Selassie, one of them is not going to be doing that as much. So that's okay. We can work with that and not work with it to erase it. It's work with it to accentuate the positive aspects of what form could be, should be, and hopefully will be. So it is not overcomplicating it by saying, hey, here's a 20-point process on how to fix your form. Or when I see people going out there and saying, I was told to land on the on the front of my feet, on the balls of my feet, and I can see them out there, and I'm like, well, I know one thing's going to happen. You're going to successfully land on the balls of your feet on this run, and then you're not going to run for four days because your calves are going to be rocked. And you, then you're just going to get hurt because you just, I've, I've seen like three people in my life land on the balls of their feet on an easy run. Jeez. When you sprint, sure. Show them a pair of clean heels. We, we push off. And if you watch like the hundred, their heels are never touching the ground. Distance race, it's a little bit different. But I see people reacting to articles and podcasts and, and, and consultants that are saying, hey, listen, I can perfect your form. No, you can't. You can't perfect anything. You know what I mean? Like you just, you can't. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to strive for as long as you know that it's a journey that will never end. It's a journey that will never get a finish line. And if that's what excites you and motivates you, okay. The problem is, is if not reaching the destination is a, um, used as a, as proof of failure, then, then running after perfection is, is a lost cause then running after perfection is, is sheer stupidity. I think understanding um, that the inability to reach perfection is actually a great gift because it means that there's always upside. It means there's always room at the top because there is no top. It's an infinite ceiling that we'll never reach, but that means there's a lot of room to get better in a lot of different ways. That's what excites me about working in sports and working with athletes is knowing no matter how great we get, there's always room to get better. That's fun. That's exciting. And get better in so many different ways because there are so many different ways to measure betterment, especially in running. So did I just go off on a tangent? I did. I did. But I think everyone understands what the purpose of this episode was about running isn't complicated. Runners are. We're the ones that will go after and chase after perfect form because we feel like there is in reach perfection. And for some of us, it's not the excitement about trying to be perfect. It's really about having an excuse to beat us up for not being perfect, even though we've got no chance. And that's because of the way that people were taught how to deal with this sport or because of relationships they had with certain teachers or parents or coaches in their past or just a current relationship they have now with themselves where it's not about trying to get better. It's not a positive experience. It's just another excuse to beat yourself up for not being perfect, even though you'll never be perfect. So if you are someone who for whatever reason has come into some type of relationship with yourself where you, you, you can't allow yourself to be better, you can only allow yourself to not be perfect in a very, very damaging way, well, it's good for the coach to know that because then one of our jobs is to work with you on that. One of our jobs is to help communicate with you and to you that this isn't about being perfect and this isn't going to end with you better by beating yourself down. That's not how this is going to work. So like I said, something as simple as running form can come across as a wildly complicated subject 
to an athlete, and it can mean so many things beyond just a slight lean forward. It can mean way more because even though the conversation of running form, even though the concept of running form isn't complicated, the runner can be really complicated. And that's okay. That's okay. As long as you know it. So that's the episode. And what's cool is I'm really excited that like we're kind of handing a baton off to another episode of Running Isn't Complicated. Runners are. You just have to make sure you tell me what are some other topics you want to uncomplicate. What are some other topics you want to talk about and break down and realize like, oh, okay, this isn't complicated. I was complicating it or other runners were complicating it. Or sometimes you just you don't see it the right way and the angles are off. And suddenly when you line everything up the right way, yeah, okay, I get it. This isn't that complicated. So reach out and let me know. As always, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for rating and reviewing the podcast. By the way, super important. I know I say that at the end of every podcast. But if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. It really does help. Please leave a rating, especially if it's a good rating. Leave a review. It takes, I know, a minute, uh, but but do it anyway. Come on. You know what I mean? And then if you haven't um, read Coach Bennett's newsletter, uh, there was another one that just came out a few days ago. I should be sending out a new Coach Bennett's newsletter in the next couple of days as well, um, which should be a fun one. And just thank you. Thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you for running. Thank you for taking care of yourself. And thank you for taking care of each other because I'm going to ask you to do that now. Until I talk to you next, until we reach that next starting line, go out, take care of yourself, and take care of each other. Thank you so much for listening to Coach Bennett's podcast today. And if you're not already following or subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening, well, I really wish you would because it helps a lot. Also, check out the show notes because you'll find a link to Coach Bennett's newsletter as well as all the social media sites that I'm on. Places like threads and facebook and instagram and mastodon and youtube and even the artist formerly known as twitter whatever that dumpster fire is called today you'll find a link to it because i'm on there thank you so much again for listening and until next time take care of yourself